Hello, and welcome to the sinking of HMS Royal Pindy, which is going to be slightly different than I normally do. I'm going to start off by saying hello in the normal fashion, but in a second I'm going to disappear, and there's going to be a collection of images coming up. As I pre-recorded and read from this. It's Sub-Lieutenant. It's published in October 1942. Written in the years before that, and it's written by Ludovic Kennedy, the naval officer and son of Captain Edward Kennedy, who commanded HMS Royal Pindy. And I'll be reading from this at various points in the book, but it's important to remember that some of the stuff which is written in this is actually wrong, because it's based on the understanding they had at the time in 1942-1941. It's not completely wrong. There are lots, there are parts you can't, which are quite correct. But there is a suggestion at one point where it talks about the Deutschen class vessels firing on his father's ship. And of course, it was Scharnhorst and Neithenau. But that wasn't released at the time. I'm going to start off by handing you over to that, and then I'm going to go into the normal discussion and normal slides. So, I hope you enjoy this, I hope you find it as interesting as I do, and when it's finished, and it's about eight and a half minutes long, it'll be a normal session, where normal long patrol with me with slides talking away. But, um, yeah, sort of challenging, channeling, channeling my... Uh, in a drag for this one. I thought it was appropriate. See you in a bit. I shall never forget one wet evening, sitting alone with him in the house. He pulled an envelope out of his pocket, which bore the crown of the Admiralty. I haven't shown you this before, he said, because when I first received it, there didn't seem any likelihood of it happening. It's the best news I've had for some time. I unfolded the letter and began to read. It contains several long paragraphs written in official language, but I soon had the gist of it. In the event of hostilities, would my father be prepared to take command of an armed merchant cruiser? I knew my father and understood his excitement. There is a school of naval officers, I have met some of them during this war, who are embittered at the institution which has no use for their services as senior officers. Their bitterness is understandable. When you have devoted the best years of your life to a service which equips you for no other calling and flings you out when it is done with you, you are entitled to a complaint. Shortly after the end of the, uh, end of the last war, the government, for reasons of the economy, decided to reduce drastically the number of senior naval officers. The Geeds Axe fell, and my father was placed on a retired X list. He was bitterly disappointed, but at no time embittered. He accepted the measure as necessity for the good of his country, uh, put the matter out of his head and turned his hand to politics. But he could never altogether escape the weight of the blow. Meeting old Navy friends, hearing Navy talk from the past shipmates, any incident which brought him in touch with the Navy during the post-war years reminded of a pang of his yearning for the sea, the thrill of conning a big ship, of ordering her ways, of influencing the lives of a crew, were memories which he could not e forget easily. When he received his letter from the Admiralty, he saw himself in an instant standing once more on the bridge of his own ship. I finished reading the letter and handed it back to him. He turned to me with almost youthful exuberance. I shall be sixty next week, old boy, he said, and they still have enough faith in me to offer me a ship. Eighteen years on the beach and they offer me a ship. Gosh, what a chance. What a chance. It must have come sooner than he or any of us expected. A few days later, after visiting Scotland, I had news of my father's ship. She was a P&O liner of 17,000 tons, and my fa uh, father had joined her already. At present, she was in dock, being converted into a man of war. Her luxury fittings were being removed, and six-inch guns installed on her upper decks. In six weeks, she'd be ready for sea. In six weeks, she would hoist the West Ensign and steam to her patrol, a warship of the Royal Navy. Her name was Rawler Pindy. A fortnight later, I saw my father on board Rawler Pindy. I'd never seen him so happy. 
He was like a child who had been given a new toy. During tea in his cabin, a luxurious room behind the bridge, he kept jumping up to discuss with dockyard officials alterations they were making to the ship's structure. Or one of his officers would come to him with a batch of papers for scrutiny and signature. Afterwards, he took me around the ship. We visited each cabin, each compartment, from the boat deck to the engine room, while explaining the alterations the ship was undergoing, many of which he had himself authorised. We would often stop while he straightened out some problem raised by one of the workmen. His enthusiasm was unbounded, his pride immense. I knew then that the disappointments which had been rankling for the past 18 years had vanished. They were forgotten in his passionate interest and pride in his new command. Before I left, he showed me the guns lying on the jetty, waiting to be fitted. Big, powerful creatures they looked, their snouts pointed threatening at the least of the sky. Across the shield of each gun was scribbled in thick white letters, Rawler Pindi. These were the guns about which my father wrote later to a friend. They have given me some guns, good guns, and I am going to use them. That was the last time I saw my father, but he used his guns all right. Letter from the senior Kennedy. My dear boy, I have several letters of yours to answer. Some I fear are rather old, but that cannot be helped as I have no time when we are in harbour for perhaps a couple of days, and then we are at sea for several. My mother told you of two days that we had when we spent a night at the cottage. Most comfortable. Then lunch with Gar, finishing with a flick in Glasgow before we were off again. This we hope to repeat, but our future is always uncertain. I was very pleased to hear how well you shot with Uncle Tom. You mentioned this to me yourself, and I also heard it from Beechwood. When you mu what you must learn now is the driven bird low and high though I don't know when you will get any practice of this. Once you get the knack, you'll be all, uh, be all right. But it's quite different to walking up. Your gun seems to fit you admirably. Yes, I did shake hands with the king when he visited the fleet, and we had quite a chat. His equerry, Harold Campbell, I know well, and I was glad to meet him and others who I've not seen for years. It's very amusing meeting some of the bigwigs now, who were contemporaries of mine. They're all very jolly and welcoming. One full admiral, whom I have not met before, remarked in conversation, I see you have the China Medal. What ship were you in? To which I replied that I was a sub in the Bar Fleur, when he said that he was a midshipman in the Inman. While writing the above, the bridge reported that our pet iceberg was again in sight, a formidable ghost-like object, so I thought this was a, this is a good opportunity to do some more gunnery. We had a very spirited attack on it this afternoon, at long range, and with considerable motion on the ship, which made it difficult, but very instructive. What I want to know is how long you will remain a midshipman, what work and general training you do, this your next letter will probably tell me, when you are likely to get a sea appointment and what form it is likely to take. Another thing I want to know is the question of your finances. Tell me frankly, have you any debts now or are you they all paid off? And if they are, pray do not involve yourself in any that you cannot meet. What pay will you get? What will your messing cost? What do they allow you for uniform? All this I want to know and then I will see what allowance to give you. Now is the time when we must all live as economically as possible. Income tax has soared up and I don't know what I shall be doing, if anything, once we've seen this show through. Best of luck, my dear fellow. Pop. The middle of the November is about the worst of time, and this is back to Ludovic, of the year to visit Bedford. The river ooze overflows and floods the surrounding countryside, which is as flat as a billiard table, a foot deep. Blankets of fog descend on the town, lingering for days. The atmosphere is damp and not very healthy. There are no industries of much importance in Bedford, so far as I know, and there are certainly no attractions. I arrived at Antville, and we dined and went into the library to hear the news on the wireless. It's queer now how detachedly one listens to the news nowadays, a result, I suppose, of listening to it so often. I was smoking a cigarette and drumming my fingers on the table, not concentrating on what was being said, when one word struck a chord in my brain and made me sit bolt upright on my chair. Then the subconscious part of my brain transmitted the last few words to the conscious part. The Secretary of the Admiralty, came the impressive voice of the answer, regrets to announce the loss of the armed merchant cruiser Rawler Pindi. HMS Rawler Pindi was an ex p and liner of 17,000 tonnes. The voice drifted on, but I did not listen. For I knew then that my father was dead. My father came of the old and noble breed of naval officers who hold honour dearer than life. To them, the achievements of the ship are due to the resource of her captain. 
If a captain should hazard his ship, whether the blame is attributable to him or not, it is his duty to go down with her. Today, a younger school derides this theory. It recognises that the captain should be the last to leave his ship, but insists that while there is an opportunity for him to get away, he should take it, and thus be of further service to his country. That is a reasonable view, of course, but one cannot well criticise such men as Captain Maked Jones of the Courageous, who remained alone on the bridge of his ship, saluting the flag as she went down. I went over to the telephone and eventually was put through to the Admiralty. A long pause and a voice said, The Captain? No, I'm afraid he's gone. So, I hope you found that interesting. And we're going to get on with talking about what was Royal Appendix. She was an R-Class ship, but we're not talking about an R-Class battleship, are we? If we had been talking about an R-Class battleship, I'm fairly sure Shan Horse and Eisenhower wouldn't have engaged. Because they have powerful 11-inch guns, but no one wants to get that close to a 15-inch gun when you've not got the armour for it, and when you've only got 11-inch guns and you're facing off something which is designed to take 15-inch guns. Maybe we can we can discuss the penetrating power and capabilities and the targeting accuracy of an R-Class battleship, but um, yeah. This is far more prey for the Sharnhorst class than an R class. And they were Rampura, Ranjuta, Ranjuta, and Rolindi and Ranchi. They were built for the British India, li India lines of the PO. They were to do the London to Bombay route. They are fairly big, fairly capable ships, but they're not what we would call ocean liners in that sense. They are merchant liners. They are possibly cruise liners, you might even call them that. But they are mixed ships which can carry passengers in eh, quite a level of comfort. But also, they can carry a lot of cargo. They're quite stable ships. They're quite economical ships to run. They are useful. And they're also something quite special. One of these, after World War II, would be the ship which carries, I think it's from memory, it's Ranchi, uh, which carries Cliff Richard back from India to the UK, I think. Uh, these are ships which you would have seen a lot, of, a lot about, but they wouldn't have been particularly famous on the scale of famous ships at the time, but they were probably also distinctive enough that if you were familiar with the route or at all familiar uh, with the ports, they were ships which you looked out for when they came in, because they all had a certain style and a certain grace. They were built under the leadership of Sir James McKay, who was Lord Incape, and chairman of the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company what P&O stands for. And if you're going, ah, oh, I didn't realise that. Quite a lot of people don't. It's been P&O for so long, everyone forgets what the, the name actually st stands for. But originally, Peninsula and Oriental Steam Company. Steam Navigation Company. P&O. And it's kind of appropriate that this is all sort of a, um, about familiar relationships in this video, because, well, you have the McKays. Sir James McKay, orders and constructed. He gives his daughter a sort of break as a designer, and she was a noted architect at the time and earned quite a lot of money doing that design, interior design and architecture work. Um, she's also an aviatrix who had promised the family that she wasn't going to fly across the Atlantic while they were away because she knew they weren't quite trusting of it and she bought an aircraft for it but they were worried and then she goes off when they're in, when he's actually in Egypt and well unfortunately dies it's always one of those interesting contests where you sit there and go well he's standing in the way of her passion true by not asking to go, but also then you consider the risks of going and you can almost understand a father going, 
please don't. Although there had been some interesting reports about an earlier marriage, but he appears not to have liked her actor husband. But she did play, had been at the time in being an actress, which he was fine with. So, they're an interesting couple in terms of a father daughter relationships. He seems to support her a lot in giving her a lot of things like decorating the ships, etc. He, he's, he's trying to give her a, a set her up with an income and work and, you know, treat her as. Get her, give her the experience, but he's also a very protective father in some respects. Probably quite a slight controlling, but we're not, we're not, we're not sure. You know, there's a debate about it. And the only reason I'm getting into this and talking about these ships is I, this with the ships is I want you to realize that these ships are not warships. They're not designed in the traditional way. You would never get Admiral Henderson being able to turn around and go, ah, yes. I will appoint my daughter to be in charge, or my son to be in charge of this part of the design process. Couldn't have done that. So, these are civilian ships. They are quite ornately and well-decorated ships. She has a huge budget to them. We are not talking... In modern times, what are we probably talking about? I'm trying to think. We don't really have ships like it these days. We don't have ships which are top deck, probably ocean liner, almost level quality transport and travel. Below that, merchant ship hull full of space to taking a load of goods. We don't really have that combination these days in service. Which is a shame. Because it could be quite an efficient and economical way to and environmentally friendly way to in, in, travel around the world. We'll see you tomorrow. As you can see, the yards are built in a certain style. And this is Aranchi post World War II, when she's had everything combined into a single funnel. And you can see a roll of Hindi. Roll of Hindi, up there. And uh, this, of course, down here, is Rajputana, who will also be sunk during World War II, I think. Yes. They were armed merchant cruisers. And this is getting into the meat of today's discussion. Our merchant cruisers are not what you think they are. In that, they are not armoured. They do not become cruisers in any way, shape or fashion in terms of the military terminology. They are taking a merchant ship, which has a sufficient speed and range, adding guns on it, and that is it. Now, why is this relevant to today's discussions? Because today, like in the 1920s and 30s, we don't have enough ships. We aren't building enough warships for the needs in wartime. We really aren't. We aren't even building enough, really, for peacetime. This leads to all sorts of ideas and discussions. And this actually is a battle of merchant cruisers, our merchant cruisers from World War One. In this period, the idea was that, well, if they were sufficiently fast enough and you put on some six inch guns, they could stand against a similarly converted merchant radar. The problem comes because they're not given the divisions and the capability is necessary to sort of withstand torpedo attack as a warship would be, which is causes them to have a bit of a loss rate versus submarines. And they have no armor or armoring, and they are quite tall and big. They don't tend to be as fast. And I have mentioned several times they're not as armored. 
and they'd still do sterling work. And in World War One and World War Two, in those massive wars, the need for ships and the need for escorts, for convoys and patrol ships for the Northern Patrol and all these things, when you have only a certain number of vessels, yeah, the risk is probably justified. But in those days, there was a chance of escape. There was a chance of being able to hide behind an ice floe. There was a chance that your guns would cause damage. A commercial hull dealing with a missile strike is not something which anyone should really want to think about. And the idea of turning a merchant hull into a critical weapon of war, and these are not critical weapons of war. They are not frontline assets. They are for secondary, tertiary, quadri tier roles. They're convoy escorts, long range ones, when they're worried about surface raiders. And the surface raiders they're merely, what I'm mainly worried about aren't the warship versions. They are for extra patrol assets, but there are proper cruisers on patrol as well. These are about multiply and multiplying your eyes when you don't have helicopters, you don't have aerial reconnaissance assets, and you certainly don't have satellites. There are all sorts of reasons these are justifiable in their times. But they take a tremendous suffering. So let's consider HMS Royal Lapindi, and this is a picture which I have found of her. Uh, it comes out was found on uboat.net, and I think it's quite accurate and true. But I haven't been able to find any other picture of her, so I'm hoping it's true. I have zoomed in as much as I can, and that little squiggle just below and to the oh, left, right to the left. As I'm doing it, or possibly the right on your screen, uh, is I think Rule of Hindi. Anyway, she's commanded in World War Two by Captain Edward Coverley Kennedy, Royal Navy. She's built for the London to Bombay route by Harlan and Wolf. She's laid down in 1920. She's launched in March 1925. She's completed September 1925. She is requisitioned before war begins in August 1939. So everyone knows war's coming. This is another thing, again, Britain's preparing for war. They are planning and hoping to build more ships. They're hoping to get everything ready. But in case they don't, they are starting to requisition up merchant ships. And again, if you have a large merchant marine and you have the capability there, go for it. She is commissioned in September 1939 and she's sunk in November 1939. She is, well, 14 years old, we'd probably describe her as at this point. So she's not that old a ship. She's in good nick, good commission. Her tonnage, 16,697 gross registered tons. Length, 548 feet or 167 meters. Beam, 69 feet or 21 meters. Draft, 29 foot. To six, uh, six inches or 8.9 meters. As said, she's built for the London to Bombay route. She'll be sunk in the high reaches of the North Atlantic. The fact that she was able to accommodate such a different scenario from her normal route she'd been designed for shows the quality of her construction and shows that she had been designed with some forethought in mind. In case routes changed and all these things. She was powered by two quadruple expansion four-cylinder steam engines deploying 15,000 indicated horsepower across twin screws. 
Her top speed is debated. If you read Wikipedia and some books, they put it to 15 knots. If you read some of the official pages about her from the PNR, PNR etc., it's listed at 17 knots. And that is the figure which I get in a, some other books, including one of Kennedy's own books. So that's Ludovic Kennedy's own books. So I put that in there. There's also a dispute about the complement. We do know that when she went down, she had roughly 276, possibly slightly more, offers as a men aboard. But her official configuration, when she's first being crewed out, is 249, uh, which would be 39 officers and 210 ratings. This seems to have quickly been grown because of needs of war. Armament? Well, 8 6-inch Mark Seven guns. So, yeah. Eight single mounts. Two quick firing three inch anti aircraft guns. This is not a warship. Just as any idea that you could stick a portable container of sea scepters or cam missiles aboard a merchant ship and call it a warship today. Let's consider her captain. And this is something else which we had available in the 1930s. We don't have a similar resource available today, despite what we might think and hope we don't have the same level of resource. They had a captain like this available to call on. Edward Coverley Kennedy. Born August 1879, died November 1939, years of service 1892 to 1921 and 1939. He was a victim of the Guides Axe, which I'll discuss in a second. Ships commanded HMS New Zealand, acting commander. He was her executive officer. Uh, he was promoted to acting captain when her captain was ill, and he retained that rank when her, a new captain arrived, although she, he then reverted to her executive officer, but she had, then had two captains aboard of her. HMS Angora was his first official ship command. HMS Cassandra, HMS Constance, and of course, HMS Royal of Hindu. So two C-class light cruisers. Career, Lieutenant, on 9th November 1900. He started off in 1892, joining Britannia. So he it took him eight years to get to full Lieutenant. But that's, considering training and time as a midshipman, that's fairly good. He's commander by December 1912, which is very good. If you consider that that means he is... 33 years old and a commander. He's a captain by December 1917. Effect of World War One, maybe, but he's got to captain by 38. You don't do that through being bad at your job either. And according to Dreadnought Pro Project, Kennedy was reprimanded following a court martial in mid 1921 as he did not take proper measures to suppress an outbreak of insubordination in Portsmouth Royal Fleet Reserve Battalion No. 2, then stationed at Newport, Monmouthshire. Kennedy had merely been appointed uh, to Portsmouth for the senior officer's technical course at the time. May have been his job, it might not have been his job. The point was, he was senior officer at the time there, and he took the side of the mutineers and said, hmm, now this is a guy who goes on to become a conservative agent during uh, the interwar years. And for those who don't know that, in the UK political system, you um, there's usually most of the MPs, etc., will have an agent who is the person who is a paid member of staff, who is in charge of making sure their leaflets are distributed, making sure they're all done officially and to all the legal requirements, and other ones who can take actually be sent to jail if anything does break the law in terms of the literature. 
basically the British system presumes that the candidate's going to be too busy to check these things themselves, so they have an agent appointed whose job it is to keep everything to the legal requirements. In the Times obituary for him, a friend, R.B., wrote, No one would have laughed more than Kay at the concept of himself as a national hero. Yet if high courage, rare simplicity, and single-minded devotion to duty constitute an enduring claim to fame, no one deserves his laurels more than he. For he is one of the most gallant men who ever lived. As commander of the New Zealand during the last war, he established his reputation as one of the best executive officers in the Grand Fleet. Subsequently, he commanded the mine layer Angora, and as captain of the Cassandra, he, he was, was present at the surrender of the German high seas fleet. Yet even this war record was super surpassed by the services he rendered as captain of the light cruiser Constance on the West Indies station in 1919 and 1920, when he was instrumental in quelling disturbances both at Belize and Kingston, which in less capable hands might have had serious consequences. The year 1921 found him in command of a battalion of naval reservists at Newport during the strike. Confronted by unexpected difficulties, he took a wider view of the critical situation than, at the time, the service was able to accept. His action is now generally regarded as wise and correct, but in circumstances he could scarcely expect to escape the axe, which soon afterwards fell upon 75% of senior naval officers. He threw himself into political work with characteristic enthusiasm, but his heart was always on the sea, with the navy he loved so well. In his family and his friends, he found solace. He was a great sportsman. For the large set shoot, he had no use. But he was a quick, accurate shot and a first-rate fisherman. Over rough country, with a dog at his heels or with a trout rod in his hand, he was in his element, and always he contrived to impart something of his own zest to those who were with him. His happiness and pride, when at an outbreak of war at the age of 60, and after 17 years of retirement, he was appointed to command the Royal Appendi, was wonderful to see. They've given me some fine guns, he said to a present writer, and in this war I'm going to use them. Now he is gone, in a blaze of glory. Those who loved him find it impossible to believe that his radiant, vivant personality has been altogether taken from them. But he himself would have asked for nothing better than the end in which life and work, uh, in which came to him. No time, uh, no finer vindication of his whole life and work. I can hear him saying, "It's the Deutschland, all right," and the ring of his voice as he gave the order for action stations. In one of his last letters, posted two days before the fight, he wrote, "I am as content as it's possible to be. He may well be content, uh, content today." That. As I mentioned earlier, was published at the time, and there's going to be more quotes from Ludovic Kennedy, which were published at the time, and they believe it's a Deutschland. Interesting enough, on the belief that it was a Deutschland, there is a huge fleet of cruisers hunting out there for it after the Royal Opinion goes down. Not sure what would happen if they come across the Scharnhorst and nice now, but I'm fairly sure there would have been battleships being sent their way. Could have turned into an, well, Let's put it this way. Sean Orson and Eisenhower withdraw after this and we'll discuss the, after this engagement and we'll discuss that. But if they continued on, it could well have turned into a forerunner of the Bismarck scenario. So, where was he on patrol? Well, he's part of the Northern Patrol, which is designed divine between the 7th and the 10th cruiser squadrons. The 7th cruiser squadron are the 4C class, 4D class, and at the beginning of the war, not only do they have Effingham as a flagship, they have the two E-class vessels are there until the armed merchant cruisers become available. The armed merchant cruisers vessels are grouped together under 10th Cruiser Squadron. This force is all under command of Vice Admiral Sir Max Horton. Mm -hmm. And basically, their job is to cover what we would all call the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, which becomes a big thing during the Cold War to cover, and always is a big thing to cover. It especially becomes critical after Norway falls, but this is before Norway's fallen. But the idea is that any ships which manage to sneak up the coast of Norway and get out, before they get in Atlantic, should hopefully be seen and spotted by the vessels on this very cold, very blustery, freezing patrol duty. And this is what's coming towards him. 
or Day Doesn't Hurt, The Terrible Twins, on their first sortie. Sean Horson, nice enough. Now, there is a debate as to when they're sent out, as to whether they're sent out to cover the withdrawal of the Deutschland after the German Navy realises what happens if the Deutschland gets sunk. The British get the claim they've sunk Germany. Uh, but the Royal Navy, we all can think about that one as an option, but these two come out. And their mission, if we go back to this one, is to go hunting in the North Atlantic. They are supposed to get out, come out, uh, go out r wide around the UK, and then come down into the North Atlantic to cause trouble with convoys and trade and basically make a nuisance of themselves. It could have been absolutely devastating, as whilst I might make jokes about the 11-inch guns versus 15-inch guns, there aren't that many battleships in the Royal Navy. There aren't that many ships wandering around at this point, which aren't already committed to other things. So these two could have potentially been very devastating. If they had been unfortunate to come across one of the rare convoys, which does have an R-class battleship in escort of, they could have faced trouble. But if we think about it, at this beginning point of the war, the Royal Navy's bringing on reserve crews, or everything's still being worked up, this is not a good point for the Royal Navy to have these two coming out. Which kind of makes sense of what Royal Lipindi does. Because there is a debate as to whether or not he should have surrendered, he should have given up. Transmitted messages, he told everyone was coming, what was coming, but if he surrenders, he gives them a victory straight off. But also, that means they can get on more quickly. Any kind of combat, any kind of fighting is going to take more time. And it's also going to potentially cause some damage. Even with eight six-inch guns. No armor, no speed to outrun them, no torpedoes. If she'd had torpedoes, that would be a freaking scary thing. And I can say that honestly because there is actually a debate over who fires first. Now, before I get into the events, I'm going to, with this one behind me, read you this chapter quickly. During the last war, the 10th Cruiser Squadron, consisting of armed passenger and merchant ships, formed what was known as the Northern Patrol. The limits of this patrol stretched from the north of Scotland to the Faroes, then south of Iceland to the north coast of Norway. Its obje object was twofold. To intercept German merchant shipping endeavouring to return home via the North Sea, and to report the presence of enemy warships breaking out into the Atlantic to raid our convoys. So successfully was this duty executed that on the outbreak of this war, the squadron was reformed. Within a few weeks, and many armed merchant cruisers were at sea. One of the first commissioned was Rolla Pindi. By the beginning of October 1939, she was patrolling the desolate waters south of Iceland. Her complement was 39 officers and about 210 ratings. Of the, of the officers, only one, Mr. French, was on the active service list of the Royal Navy. With the exception of Captain and First Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander Molson, Royal Navy, all the other officers were drawn from the Naval and Vol Naval Volunteer Reserves. The men, with few exceptions, were reservists or pensioners. Many of the officers and men had served in the ship under the Red Ensign. The service of the Northern Patrol is arduous and must be endured in the worst kind of weather. In winter, daylight lasts only a few hours. Blizzards and snowstorms lash the seas, and there is always a bitter, numb and cold, which seems to take the breath out of the body. Royal Pindy seems to have been a happy ship, and the crew seem to soon to have accustomed themselves to their new duties. A few days after sailing for the first patrol, my father wrote home, Everything is beginning to shape well. Molson has just left me after a long talk about everyone. We are happy about everything, and agree that in a short time we will be able to hold our own with the others. At sea, everyone is a different person, and the crew seem to be settling down very well. A few days later, he wrote, everything on the ship is slowly and surely shaping itself. It has been an interesting experiment trying to circulate the right spirit into such a mixed crowd. The mercantile firemen, 
who are usually very undisciplined, are coming quite into line, and who express the wish to share the same recreation room as the seamen, to which the latter have agreed. They don't want to be different, a very good sign, and after my rounds this morning I was able to congratulate various people on the way they had cleaned up their departments. An excellent atmosphere is beginning to prevail. About himself, he wrote, I wondered from the start if I had got too rusty. Some things certainly were a bit strange at first, but I feel now as if I was back in the last war. There be no interlude at all. I was, it has all come back, and I find there is little I have forgotten. But I feel I must make good, and I realise the responsibility of this command more than I ever did in my former commands. There is little opportunity for exercise on board a warship at sea, so my father introduced the routine which he had evolved when commander of the battle cruiser New Zealand in the last war. He made the men march round the deck several times after morning prayers. I warned them we would do it, and I myself led them with Molson. Some of the mercantile men thought a bit it a bit of a joke until I made them run the last lap of over 300 yards. They were all so pumped, except me, that they became quite subdued and appreciated that they were all the better for it. We'll probably do it daily. So Rural Pindy patrolled her station in the North Atlantic. Although the squadron of armed merchant cruisers engaged on Northern Patrol had no flagship, the flag of the Vice Admiral Northern Patrol is flown ashore. Rural Pindy, by virtue of her captain's seniority, was looked upon as the flagship. For this reason, her crew were especially anxious to maintain the highest standard of fighting efficiency. My father lost no opportunity to exercise guns crews and gun crews and put in as much practice shoots as it was ever allowed. In all respects, wrote Sir Max Horton, the Vice Admiral Commanding Northern Patrol, Rural Pindy and his command was outstanding. The high standard he expected and got was reflected in the smartness and appearance of his ship and the ship's company. On our first patrol, Rural Pindy intercepted the German merchant her crew were taken prisoner. The captain of the G wrote my father was a real gentleman. Before leaving Royal Pinney, he wrote my father a letter thanking him for the kind and cordial treatment he and his crew had received on board, which he said he would never forget, and he presented my father with his binoculars. The only possession he'd saved from a ship, these were handed on to Sub Lieutenant Anderson, the boarding officer, who has them today. At the end of Royal Pinney's first and second patrols, my father got a few days' leave, which he spent with my mother and sisters at the cottage, cottage in Perthshire. One of these visits, my mother had uh, had happened to ask him, What would you do if you sighted the Roy Deutschland? Run like a hare, he had replied. About the middle of November, Royal Pinney left harbour and steamed towards uh, and northwards on her third and last patrol. The weather was vile as usual, and in order to pass the tedious hours, a concert party was arranged. First performance was held on the evening of the 22nd of November. It was a huge success. The captain was asked to do a turn, and to everyone's surprise, agreed. He sang Tom Bowling and sat down amid much applause. So successful was the concert that it was decided to hold a second performance the next evening. The following day, the 23rd, a Swedish ship was sighted, and Sub Lieutenant Anderson, the boarding officer, was ordered to take her into a British port with an armed guard. Anderson was appearing in the concert party and had no wish to leave the ship. So he spun a coin on Lieutenant Pickerskill, the second boarding officer, to decide which of them should command the armed guard. Anderson lost and left the ship. Royal Pindy continued her patrol until about 3.30 in the afternoon, when, in the words of the Admiralty communique, she sighted an enemy ship. My father looked at her through his glasses. It's the Deutschland, all right, he said. Action stations were rung under the alarm bells and, of course, was altered anyway, away. Smoke floats were lit and thrown into the water, but unfortunately they failed to burn. A signal was sent at once to the base reporting the enemy's position, course and speed. The only warship, later evidence turns, attends to show that it was not the Deutschland, closed Royal Pindy and made the signal stop in English and German. This was disregarded and a warning shot was fired across Royal Pindy's bows. This too was disregarded. About 3.45 the German ship opened fire of her main armament and Royal Pindy replied with her four starboard six-inch guns. In a very short time, the enemy had found the range and was hitting British cruiser frequently. By four o'clock, the bridge and central controls, the wireless room and the ammunition supply had been blown away. The ship was on fire fore and aft and blazing fearlessly. Nevertheless, the guns' crews continued to fire until they, or their guns, had been destroyed. At least one hit seems to have been registered on the enemy. The appearance of a second German warship on the port quarter, which opened up a crossfire, hastened the end. By a quarter past four, every gun had been silenced and the ship was a blazing mess. A group of 40 to 50 men and one officer, Lieutenant Pickerskill, that second boarding officer, gathered on the poop, 
the only place in the ship not swept by fire. Some were wounded in great pain, but no one complained. Without hope of salvation, they shared out their cigarettes and waited quietly for the end. Suddenly, a waterlogged lifeboat was seen drifting past the ship's side. Most of the men, dazed by the events of the last hour, could not bring themselves to jump 30 feet into the rough sea, but several went over the side, and of these, 11 succeeded in climbing into the boat. The blazing power of Royal Pindy, drifting away from them into the night. The next day, numb with cold and utterly exhausted, they were picked up by HMS Chitterall. So ended the first naval action of the war. Royal Pindy went down with colours flying, and with a grand tradition of safe in her keeping. No greater tribute could be paid to a captain, and the officers and men who manned her, than the simple words of the Prime Minister in the House of Commons four days later. They must have known, as soon as they sighted the enemy, that there was no chance for them. But they had no thought of surrender. They fought their guns till they could be fought no more. They then, many of them, went to their deaths and thereby carried on the great traditions of the Royal Navy. Their example will be an inspiration to those who come after them. As mentioned earlier, there is a debate. What we do know of the events when we put together the German account and the British account and all the things that have come together is this. Whilst patrolling on the north of the Faroe Islands on, November, on the 23rd of November 1939, Royal Pindy investigates a possible enemy sighting. She had been briefed that day that then Deutschland might be out and might be around. That was the intelligence going available. Only to find that she encountered two powerful German warships, the battleship Scharnhorst and Eisenhower, which had been conducting a suite between Iceland and the Faroes and were planning on going south. Royal Pindy was to able to signal the German ships at the location back to base, although she only identified one at the first and mistook it for the Deutschland. Hence, based on the intelligence available and seeing a ship which looked similar, they went for it. Peering through the gathering gloom, Captain Kennedy thought, uh, Kennedy thought he recognised the silhouette of an enemy battle cruiser in his binocular, uh, binocular lenses. On the other hand, could it be the Deutschland after all? Whatever, this was no time for games of I spy. The captain ordered action stations, Followed swiftly by a command to change course to port. The duty radio operator was told to send enemy sighting reports without delay. Next moment, her alarm bells going like hammers of hell. Royal Pindy steered full speed towards the fog banks enveloping shelter. Smoke floats were lit and flung into the water. He's trying to get away. He's trying to keep his ship arrived. He's pointed out the enemy. He's now trying to withdraw. They failed to ignite. In an instant, Captain Kennedy ordered a course change to starboard, where a large uh, iceberg rain, uh, was about four miles away. Held out a better promise of protection than a fog bank. But it was too late. The German warship was fast approaching, cutting off Royal Pindy's escape route. And if you can't escape, well, from a bridge, the enemy flash signal heaved to. Backed up with a warning shell that was sent up for, uh, found a spray at some 200 yards in front of Royal Pindy's bows. Despite being hopelessly outgunned, Captain Kennedy decided to fight rather than surrender, as demanded by the Germans. We heard to say, we'll fight them both. They'll sink us, and that'll be that. Goodbye. Now, the debate that goes through it is exactly what happened and who fired first. The German vessels certainly draw closer and they try and signal a couple more times for the British, uh, for Royal Pindy to surrender. And it certainly seems that the Germans presumed that she would surrender. Because... The Germans and the Captain Hoffman seems to be signalling, abandon your ship. At about the same time that six inch shells start to go off around his ship. That's the Scharnhorst.
In fact, he is just about deciding that he's going to, according to the Germans, fire when the six-inch shells start to burst. So my thinking is that Captain Kennedy started firing first. Now, you can sit there and go, why? He's completely outnumbered. He's completely... Out He's not going. They're not going to surrender. That's not going to happen. But also, why fire first? Because his only chance is to fire first. If he can get a lucky hit in with his six inches shell, six inch guns, he might be able to blast past and get to that iceberg. He might be able to get to safety. He has tried to head for a fog bank. He has tried smoke. He has tried everything. As he talked to his wife, he said he would try and get away. But he can't outrun these ships. He could hide. He, his aim was to try and hide from them. And once you can't hide, you're cornered. And now he's going to fight. And he fights to the best of his ability. And his ship fights to the best of his ability. There is a debate as to whether her shells hit Nightingale before they hit Scharnhorst. But she seems to be it had gone right then. I have four six inch guns either side. You four will take that one. You four will take that one. Bang. Yes, we're going to be in the crossfire. But also, this might have been again in going through Kennedy's mind and instructions. If he gets between the two ships, then they might not want to fire their eleven, their main guns and the battery guns at him, because for fear of hitting each other. There are no good options. This is a Kabashi Maru. This is a bad. This is a bad scenario. Whatever you're talking about. And he is seeking the least worst option. But he's not surrendering. Because the more he's fighting and the more he fires, the more time he buys for those other ships which are going to be responding to his signal. We do know that the third salvo knocked out the Royal of Pindy's electrical system, which stopped the ammunition witches, winches, and so left the guns only with the ready-use ammunition they had available. That was followed by a salvo destroying the bridge in wireless room, which is almost certainly kills Captain Kennedy and most of his officers, his officers up there. After 30 to 40 minutes of bombardment, all guns were out of action and all Pindy was well ablaze. She remained afloat until about 8 o'clock that night, when the ship capsized and sunk with a loss of 263 men. Around 30 survivors were reported as being taken prisoner, but 11 men were rescued by the armed merchant cruiser HMS Chitral. Captain Kennedy was posthumously mentioned in dispatches. And Shitterall, it should be noted, is another merchant crew, a uh, command uh, merchant ship. <sighs> so, what's the memory of it? It's forgotten in some respects. The Battle of the River Plate and other events overtake it in history, but it should be remembered. The first battle of a naval battle of World War II, the first naval action, is a fight between a hopelessly outgunned armed merchant cruiser and two of the finest vessels of war that Germany has ever constructed. There is one more point to think of from the memory. Later in the war, when 
Ludovic Kennedy was a midshipman and junior officer aboard HMS Tata, that well-known tribal class destroyer. They had been also escorting the Prince of Wales, which had aboard it the Prime Minister. On arrival in harbour two days later, the captain took the ship skillfully alongside the Prince of Wales. We were to have the honour of taking the party to the last stage of the journey to the port where it would catch the London train. The Prime Minister addressed the ship's company of Prince of Wales from the quarterdeck, then, bidding goodbye to the Commander-in-Chief, stepped on board and was taken up to the bridge. He was joined there by Sir John Dill, Sir Wilfred Freeman and Sir Dudley Pound. There was only just room for the captain and spider to con the ship. I went up to the director and took a photograph, but I was scared that someone might look around and spot me. In consequence, it didn't come out very well. We cast off from Prince of Wales and proceeded out of the harbour at 25 knots. The Prime Minister stayed on the bridge until we had cleared the boom. Then he went down to the captain's cabin to rest and buried himself in a three-day-old copy of the Times. Later, he spoke to me about the Royal Pindy. And that was a terrible thing, he said. The AMCs have suffered more than any other class of ship. We dropped anchor outside the harbour at noon, and a boat came alongside to take the party ashore. Then we returned to base. I went fishing in the lock that evening and caught a two-pound trout. Rather appropriate for the son of his father. In other accounts of that story, it seems that either Churchill seeks out Ludovic, or he has Ludovic called to him. He wants to talk to him. He wants to meet the son of this man who died. because. It seems to have had an impact on naval officers and of a lot of people through World War II. What his father, Edward Kennedy, had done. And what the crew of the Royal Pindy had done with him. Because that's the thing. It's, yes, we talk about the captain. Yes, I have to talk about the captain's mindset. Because it is a foe. But it's not really great man or great person history. It's an entire crew. He was talking with the chief engineer when he makes the decision. And the chief goes below. The chief engineer goes below. He sees these huge ships coming, which have these massive guns, and he knows his captain's going to need all the power from the engines. He can. So he goes below. He doesn't think of his own safety. He doesn't think, get to a lifeboat, there's no way we're winning this. He goes below. The gun crews, they don't hesitate. They don't. Run around. They, they keep firing. Even after the bridge is gone. Even after everything else is gone. They're on a merchant ship. They've got no armour. No protection. They keep firing. They do their duty. And that's the memory of it. And this is what you have to remember. What we should really remember with her. Interesting enough, I wanted to put a bit of Ludovic Kennedy in there. Because, of course... Got this book, um, very tattered, inherited from my grandfather, a copy of Ludovic Kennedy's Pursuit. Very good naval historian, also a noted campaigner for civil rights and against things like court, um, capital punishment and those things. Married, stayed faithful, and married all his life. That's him when he was about this time. That's the only picture I can find from about that time. And he's the gentleman with the glasses around his head. Uh, a noted journalist. Seems to spend his life trying to live up to an extent his image of his father. Probably a worthy one to live up to. Seems to have done a fairly good job. Lessons to the day today. Well, of the four ships, Rampura became an RN repair ship, so it's probably going to feature later this week, and served as a fleet depot ship till 1961 when broken up. She actually took part in the Suez Crisis. Ranjapatana was sunk by U-108 in 1941. Four days after parting company with convoy HX-117, while doing a patrol. And the armed merchant ships are a critical escort of convoys throughout the war. 
Royal Pindy, of course, sunk November 1939. Ananchi, which became a troop ship in 1943 and then returned to PNA in service in 1947, was broken up in 1953. And this is an idolised painting of what that crew who got away in one lifeboat might have looked like going from the Royal Pindy. Lessons for today. History gives us a lot of lessons, and people often use historical examples to show things like merchant ships can be quickly or easily converted into warships. They, they can be useful, as example as the Royal Pindy. She is useful, but they forget some of the differences. In 1939, the Royal Navy was very lucky. It had a large reserve of experienced, capable officers to draw from who were reserves. And call up a guy who hasn't commanded a ship in 17, 18 years. And they're lucky because he's good at his job. We know he's good at his job because of all the letters and all the other discussions which come home about the Royal Pindy. The crew will follow him anywhere. They think he's very good at his job. A little bit eccentric. They're not sure about the daily exercise. But he's good at his job. And he's able to manage a crew which is a very diverse crew. They are reservists. They are volunteer reserves. They are merchant sailors. Conscripted, basically... Transferred to arms uh, to naval service for the war. They are a diverse crew in a ship which is not built for what it's being done, but has been hastily converted. It's taken up in August. It's out on patrol in September. He builds an esprit de corps. Arguably, that ship shouldn't have been anywhere near there. Arguably, the Royal Navy should have had more cruisers. But it didn't. It didn't because of a treaty system, which was hoped to keep the world pe uh, peaceful. And it had failed. And when it failed, everyone was still trying to grasp at straws to keep it going. Not thinking, well, if it's failed, let's crank out the engines and turn up the bit of construction. But it takes time to do those things anyway, so it makes sense. The other question you have to ask is whether or any of those C or D class cruisers would have fared any better if they'd found themselves in that situation. Probably not, although with torpedoes. Oof, getting that close. Ooh. That's one of the, thing, uh, the things. You sit there and it's the weapons you fit them with. But, uh, yeah. Lessons for today? Don't do it. Please don't. Our merchant ships work in theory, I know, but please don't. But there is a legacy from these ships. This is a lovely drawing of the ranchy. It's a simple legacy. They were useful. They had the officers, they were there, and they have gone down in history, often ignored, but they have been so critical. People ask me how the Royal Navy puts the ships it does in the place it does, mostly because it's got other ships to cover the places where those ships might also be needed. Without these ships, convoys would have been unescorted. Without these ships, the patrols couldn't have been maintained. Without these ships and their crews and their officers, the Royal Navy couldn't have done all it was required to do. Remember, it's the grinding of war which means it has to slowly withdraw from the Far East and other positions which were it was holding a, det it was holding a deterrence position. 
without ships like the ruler Pindi and her sisters. That would have happened more quickly. And who knows what that might have caused. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a long video and it might be delayed coming up because I'm going to have to render it together in sections. But I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. Next week's patrol, long patrol will be the Battle of Tessaforonga. And the live on Thursday is the patron, is patron 30, I think it's 39, 40 actually maybe. Uh, I will go check the numbers on patrons. I think I've got numbers that got mixed up a bit at one point. Uh, repair ships from the Age of Sail, if any, through Steam and Steel. The Kamkatcha and the US's Vulcan. The future. And probably, of course, one of our R-Class ships. Also, currently live on Patreon is the suggestions. So please put in suggestions because on Thursday I'm going to start the vote. Probably Friday. I'll probably announce that it's going to be a last one on for a last chance to put the suggestions on Patreon Choice on Thursday. But please, there's a link down below to Patreon if you want to go make suggestions for pay, uh, for topics that to be covered. Please do. Take care. Oh, and thank you to everyone who subscribes. Thank you to everyone who shares, and thank you to everyone who likes the videos. I am, and also comments. Thank you to people, and please also if you do reach the end. Of this video, and you do watch it the whole way through. Can you put a clap symbol down in the bottom of the comments? Just to say you reached the end. The reason I'm doing this is because, and I keep asking this question, is two things. One, it's personal inquiry because I want to know how many people reach the end because YouTube never tells me. And so I don't know whether I'm making them too long or too short. And secondly, it's fun for me to see. And finally, I am still trying to get those 13,000 subscribers by December 31st to win the bet with my aunt. But that will entirely depend on your help. So thank you for everything you've been doing. Thank you.